hi everyone. Is this on? It's not on. Okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, right. Hi everyone. Um, it's really great to be here in Japan. Uh, I learned a little bit of Japanese, like one sentence, which is Ichigatsu kara Nihongo benkyoshimashita kero Nihongo wa muzukashi. And now I, so I translated my slides. I hope that they make sense, but um, hopefully the translators will be able to help me out a little bit. Uh, but I have to go back to English now. <coughs> All right, so today we're here to talk about uh, how to use advanced Chrome developer tools features. Last year um, in the fall, one of my favorite uh, musicians, Taylor Swift, was doing a, con a concert back in America. And she had this system where she didn't want people to uh, you know, buy every single ticket and then sell it for larger prices. So instead, she had it set up so that you could prove that you were one of the biggest fans of her music by watching music videos. And she would count up how many times you watched her music video. Um, and so of course I thought, there's, there's gotta be a way I can, I can trick the system. I can, uh, t I can show that I watched the music video a ton of times and then I'll, I'll get the best tickets. So uh, this, is, this actually all happened and so now I'm going to recreate what I did to figure all this out. Um, so, I think this says Satsume. <laughs> uh, all right, so t we made up a, or I created a fake uh, fan website for Taylor Swift, and we're going to try to watch the mu music video the most times that we can, like hundreds of times, because the people who will watch the music video the most get the tickets first. Um, so how do we prove that we are the best fans? Um, and again, all, was, this all happened to me last year. I actually went to her concert in May. So here's her website, and we can actually play with it right here. Let's close this. So you can see that I have I have not watched the video yet. Um, I chose a time, 10 second timer video because Taylor Swift's music videos are very flashy. And I didn't want everyone to get distracted. So here we've watched it, and now if I refresh the page, I have one view. So we want to get that number as big as possible. Okay, so the first thing that I thought about when I was playing around with this website is how would I be able to make this video go faster? You know, her music videos can be three minutes or five minutes long. So how do I um, not waste my time like waiting five minutes and pressing play again and, and waiting? Maybe if I watched it at two times the speed or at five times the speed, I could watch a music video even more. So I started Googling and I found out that YouTube has a um, iframe player API. So you can actually open the Chrome uh, console and you can copy this code. I found this on Stack Overflow. Um, you, <laughs> of course, everything's on Stack Overflow. And you can read that it says, um, set the playback rate to two and um, send it to the, the music video's iframe. So here I'll open the console. I made it really big and I'll paste that code in. And now when I, Press play, if I can make this, sorry, one second. This is the most painful. <laughs> oh, there it goes. <laughs> All right. So now you can see it's moving really, really fast. And in fact, if I make this number even, oh no, oh, that's a, that was a mistake. All right, um, if I make this into a four, it will go even faster. Um, so, I actually really did do this with the Taylor Swift video. I, it, her voice ended up sounding really um, high pitched because, but I was like watching this video in one minute, so that saved me a bit of time. And then I learned a little bit about the YouTube uh, API. It turns out you can do a lot of really great things with um, manipulating embedded videos. So that's the first idea. But of course, that's not good enough because then you're um, the problem with that is you have to keep pressing the button and you don't want to spend all of your time sitting there pressing play because then you can't go and do other things. So the next step is figuring out how do we communicate with the server. You know, we're inside this browser. We, um, we know that our browser is telling the server something to say that we watched the video. 
And so the real goal of this whole uh, talk is figuring out how we can um, convince the server that we, we are sending those same responses. So the network tab, um, here we can see um, everything that's going on. You know what, I'm gonna pop this out so I can stop doing that. And let me, one second, I need to exit full screen. There we go. Okay, so now I'm here in the network tab and there's a bunch of YouTube uh, related stuff. And so the first thing I'd probably wanna do if I see way too much uh, network activity is I can, let me put this so I can type. Okay, so the first thing I can do is type in here that I want to filter by domain, and I want to filter by everything going to localhost. Um, in this case, if I was on a website like taylorswift.com, I would write taylorswift.com, because I'm, is it loud enough? Should I move it closer, is this okay? Thank you. Um, so if I was on taylorswift.com, I could write that out. In this case, my, uh, Chrome is here. I'm on localhost here and that's why I need to um, filter by localhost. So now I can see all the network requests that are coming from there. And if I refresh this page, I'll see that it, there's a ton of different files that were loaded. Um, the other problem here is that some of these files I probably don't care about. For example, I loaded all of these JavaScript files but I don't necessarily want to look at those yet. When I press play, I, I know that YouTube is going to be sending some asynchronous requests, some AJAX requests. So if I click the XHR section, which is a synonym for X, uh, AJAX and AJAX and X, XHR mean the same thing, uh, then I can see only the requests that I care about. And so here I, I saw an endpoint that's called count, which I thought was interesting. Um, and I started looking through and trying to figure out like what, what were we sending it. At the bottom, there's the request payload. So you can see that when I communicate to the server to this count endpoint, I'm sending it a ID, which looks like a random string of characters. And so when I look at the response, I can see also that there's a true success. So I don't really know what this means, but you know, I can kind of start uh, investigating from here. And the first thing I tried is I right click here and there's a couple of pretty complicated things going on. Um, you can block these requests and all, but you can actually send the network requests multiple times. So if I click re replay XHR, it'll copy the exact same request and send it to the server again. So maybe if I try to count again, maybe I'll get another one. Oh, and you can see now that the count has appeared here. This is my second call, but it says success equals false. So I think that means that I wasn't successful and I can kind of check just by refreshing the page. I got the first view and um, if I press play and I wait for this video to finish. And I can see that the count request happened and it was successful again. And I can replay it. So I should, if it had worked then I should have five but I actually have four views. Um, and so just sending the count request again didn't work. So there's gotta be something else there. So the next thing that I can do is I can um, look at this count request and I can see where the request was started. Uh, this is a really useful way to find where in the code the request was created. If I hover over the initiator column and I look at what line of code it's on, I can see the stack trace for the method that called it and I can actually click on the, the line and file number. So this one says record view and this one says update view count. So maybe if I look here, then I'll see some more information. Um, I can see from the YouTube API that we're checking what the time of the current video is versus the total length of the video. If we've watched 60% of the video, then we can say that that was a view and then we'll, um, and then we've, that's how we say that we've watched the video. So what's interesting here is that, um, you know, we were talking about that ID that was sent. Let me come back over here and come to record view. I can see that I'm creating a new AJAX request and posting to the count endpoint and I'm sending it the ID JSON. But this, is, this ID is a variable, so 
maybe if I find where that ID variable comes from, then I can send it again myself. So you can actually set breakpoints as well. Um, there's actually multiple different ways that you can come back and find this information. For example, you can um, you can actually set breakpoints on Ajax activity. And so if you're ever thinking like, I want to know every single time uh, we make any sort of uh, request to localhost, then we can actually say uh, stop, stop the program anytime localhost happens. Uh, anytime localhost is the URL. So we'll try that. We had that breakpoint and we can press, oops, let me refresh. And I, oops, I think I'm, so YouTube is calling it XHR, but I can press play again. I think I'm on the wrong stack here. Hmm. Normally that works. All right, so here I'm now on this line of, uh, I'm sending out the request. So you can see I started at record view and I've watched about 70% of the video and so that's why I am now okay to record the view. If I hover, now that I'm inside the program, if I hover over the variable ID, I see that the string exists. So when I look through the rest of the file, starting from the top, but this is kind of a weird coincidence. When I looked at the, when I was looking at the source code for Taylor Swift's website, I realized that the ID was always right at the top of the file. So just by, you know, looking around, I found it. Let me turn off the breakpoints. And so every time I refresh the page, I would see that the ID keeps on changing. So that made me wonder, you know, maybe if I kept sending the, ID, if I kept sending a different ID, then maybe I would be able to uh, convince the server I was doing a new request. So the next thing that I wanted to do is um, stop that. There. Hmm. I'm not sure why this keeps pausing. All right. So now that I'm here, I can see the count endpoint again. And if I want to play around and like try to make the count request again, the other thing I can do is use curl. Uh, from the terminal, I can uh, send the command again. So if I copy this curl command and I come over to the terminal, um, this is the exact same request as before, but now I can hopefully make some edits to the, to the way it's written. So I can change this ID and let's get a new one. I come back over to sources and I get this ID right here. And what if I just try to paste it in? And you can see here, so the success is still false. So even though I count, I w went to the count endpoint again, and I used a new ID, it didn't, it still didn't work. So at this point, I started wondering, like, what did I, how can I do this? <laughs> what, what really happened here? And, um, to be honest, it took me a couple, like a, maybe a week of just like coming back and thinking about it and looking around some more. Um, and what ended up happening is eventually I noticed that when I press the play button on this YouTube video, there's also this uh, start endpoint that comes first. And you know, I looked through a lot of different network requests that were all going to uh, the, the Taylor Swift domain. And eventually I saw start and I realized that it was sending a success true response as well. And in the uh, request payload, it was sending the ID too. So what happened here is I, um, I had a breakpoint set for, oh yeah. So if I break one, it says count, so I don't send that count request. And let's refresh this page. Then now that I have not yet sent that request, I can actually use this ID. And when I come back here and use this new ID, the success actually worked. And that's because I 
had, had sent the start request through the browser and then through the terminal, when I sent the count, finally it worked. If I try sending it again, it won't work for the same reason as before. It's like you just did the replay XHR. So I thought, well, maybe if I, so that, that means that if I start with the start request and then I move on to the count request, then maybe that's what the um, server needs to validate that I really watched this video. So it's, so I can't just keep sending to the count endpoint over and over. Okay, so that means that if I get a new ID and I haven't used this one yet and I paste it here and then at the beginning, instead of posting to count, I post to start. You can see that that one was successful. And then if I come here and I put in count again, then that one was successful. So here, now I have 10 views. So I can keep kind of doing that over and over again. Um, and hopefully we can prove that we were able to uh, trick, the, trick them into saying that we watched the video. Now I have 11 views. Okay, so now how do I make this into a something programmatic where I can do it like 100 times over and over again? Well, you know, first all you need to do is get the ID out of this file. So download the counters.js file from the server, and every time you download it, the ID should change, and then send to start, and then send to count, and review. So I wrote this out already in Python. Uh, wrong one. So there's a regular expression at the beginning. It just looks for a line that says var ID equals and gets the uh, string out of there. For sending the request, we uh, post to start and then we post to count. And we'll do this a hundred times. And so when I run this file, uh, <laughs> I can come back again and now I don't <laughs> um, So now, so this is really convenient because now I can say I watched this video like 200 times. Um, <laughs> I am the, clearly, you know, the, the number one Taylor Swift fan. Um, let me get back to the slide so I can. Oh, let me recap everything that we just talked about. Um, so we did the domain filtering. We filtered by the file type, so we only got AJAX requests as opposed to you know JavaScript files or CSS files. We looked at the stack trace to figure out where the code was making this AJAX request from, and we saw that there was uh, the, there was some logic in when the co uh, this would come out. We looked at the responses and we looked at the payload, the request payload. Did all this, and so this is the plan. Um, you know, I wrote this out and I like looked up the kanji and I thought maybe I should add furigana for myself because I can't read, but I think it's like HTTP re request for <laughs> Man, <laughs> I, I knew it when I wrote it down. Okay, so moving on, how do we <laughs> how do we protect ourselves from this? Because you know. It's a really big industry. Every, if you ever have like an e-commerce or shopping website or you have anything where you're trying to give something away to uh, fans, of course someone's trying to game the system. And so there's a, there's a lot of really cool ways you can prevent this kind of behavior from your users. So the first most common one is of course the captcha. And anytime you're trying to do something like selling uh, maybe like a rare pair of shoes or something, usually you'll, send, you'll use a captcha to say that you're a human. That doesn't make a ton of sense for the Taylor Swift fan site because you wouldn't want to fill out a captcha every single time you watch the music video. So you have to be mindful of like when it's when it would be relevant. More the thing that's more important for this case is um, randomizing the DOM. So in our case we knew exactly where the ID was. It was randomly generated and it was always being inserted as the third line of the file. And we knew it was always var ID equals the string. So if we move it around, if we say like change up the variable name or put it somewhere else so that you can't just use a regular expression to get that ID, then it's a little bit harder for the person to predict um, how, how you're validating them. The other thing that you can be doing is, um, let's say you're trying to sell something on a website and you have a buy button. Uh, the user should only be able to see one uh, buy button on the page but if you insert multiple buy buttons inside the, the DOM um, and you hide some of them using CSS or whatever, uh, maybe put like a little like div right in front of it, then someone writing a program to, uh, to select the buy button 
won't know which bun is the real bun. And so that, then you can trick them, and um, if they try to submit on a fake buy bun, then you would know that they were a bot. And that's a, so that's a really common tactic. Um, add a bunch of random stuff to your, your HTML that doesn't really show up on the screen so you can catch the people who are uh, not human. The most important thing is uh, validation. I, I think that's probably the first thing you should be doing is, uh, you know, I watched that video 200 times in a few seconds, and that doesn't make any sense. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you have a five minute music video, then you should expect people to watch it every five or six minutes. Um, so in this case, you, know, you can say that it, the be user's behavior doesn't make sense, and then you can probably just say that you're not allowed to buy, to buy the concert tickets at the end. Um, the other important thing to remember is that a lot of times people will, uh, a lot of companies will not tell you if they've caught you, which I think is the best course of action. If they immediately uh, ban you or tell you that you were not successful, then of course you'll just find another way. You can make another account, you can keep trying the next day. Um, and so with the, ta the Taylor Swift website, because it kept telling me when, when success was true or when, when success was false, I knew exactly what things I was doing that were correct. If they'd always sent back a success is equal to true, like regardless of whether or not I was successful, then um, I wouldn't know if I was actually making any progress. And also um, towards the end when I was, <laughs> when the day came to buy tickets, I kept thinking maybe they caught me and maybe they actually banned me and maybe I won't be able to buy tickets and they wouldn't have told me that would actually have, uh, that would stopped me from being sure that I was successful. So these are some ways that you can uh, try to stop uh, bad users from abusing your website. Okay, so the ending. I did not get saddle banned. I actually got to buy tickets. It was, uh, so I was very excited about that. And <laughs> Kei Kakadori. Um I really like this anime called Death, Death Note. Uh, and the guy keeps saying Kei Kakadori, So that's why I uh, needed to say that. He's <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly what I looked like. Um, but it was really expensive. It was uh, about $1,000 for a front row seat. And so I was a little bit embarrassed because uh, I spent like a whole week trying to get this to work. And then at the end, I didn't even want the tickets anymore because it was too expensive. Uh, but I learned something. And then I got an internship uh, offer, which I thought was a little bit strange because, um, you know, Taylor Swift's target audience, I guess she's, a lot of her fans are around like 13 years old or, you know, not late 20s like me. So um, it was a little embarrassing, but they thought I was a kid and offered me an internship to fix their website. Um, but, you know, that's okay. I, I really am a full-time engineer. <laughs> okay, so well, the two big things that I want to, um, I guess, summarize this with and uh, hope that you all take away from this is that there are the specific tools and uh, techniques that you can use. Like you can, uh, you can run code in the console. You can do a lot of really cool jQuery kind of uh, stuff. You can do a lot of filtering to get, get down to exactly the information you want. And you can even replay XHR. You can do curls. So you can do all this cool network, uh, these network techniques to investigate a website. But the more important thing is not just the tools, but the mentality that you approach uh, the problem with. So, you know, for me, it, it took me like a week to figure all this stuff, stuff out, and I spent hours on it. But um, the important thing was that, you know, you persevere. You keep trying all different things, even if you keep failing. And even if you think like, oh man, they're gonna they're gonna ban me. It's like you have to keep trying anyway. Uh, you have to be curious about. Uh, <laughs> You have to be curious about like what kinds of things you could, could be doing, um, like what, what kinds of things you could be trying, and you can Google, you can find all those things on Stack Overflow, and you have to be a little bit resourceful and you know willing to think outside the box. And so, you know, you I think taking away the, the mentality side of it is almost more important than the specific features that you use. Okay, <coughs> so I got the Uh Here's my homepage, my Twitter. These slides are here. Uh, you can find the code for this demo if you want to practice. Um, I wrote a blog post in English about what I learned here. And I didn't mention, but I do work at a engineering company that has an office here in Japan. And they are hiring in case you want to do really cool 
API work or web-related work. All right, thank you. That's a really great point to bring up. Uh, let me repeat the question. Uh, he said, "What are you hurting accessibility by randomizing the DOM or adding more buttons in? Because if you're, say, if you're blind and you rely on um, navigating the DOM through a screen reader, then those buttons might confuse you. Um, that's a really great point. I, I think what you should be doing for that case is adding um, labels to the HTML to say, like, this is the submit button. I think there is a, you're right, I think there is a tension there where um, doing this does hurt accessibility. I hadn't thought of that. Um, I think, so I guess for people who use keyboard navigators, um, usually there's a way to like, tell the page like, that when you like, move tab or you move around, then you can select the right button. Um, I think that's making sure that that flow works is probably good. And, you know, I don't have a good answer for this. I, I think you'd have to te test it a lot to make sure it still works, but maybe maybe adding uh, hidden buttons would actually confuse people. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, this, this translation is really cool, so thank you. Um, I, so in my day job, I am a software engineer, but I'm actually a software engineer for uh, site reliability engineering. So more along the lines of making sure that Stripe stays, my company stays uh, available. So I don't get to do a ton of web Chrome related work uh, normally. I think that, that means like this kind of became my outlet. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I normally go around uh, hacking websites. I, it's, some, I mean, I, a lot of times I, I feel like it's a, almost a little bit disrespectful. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I don't, I mean, I usually just want to like, go and pay for the thing uh, sincerely. Um, a lot of times I, I think it's more fun to do uh, silly things like, you know, changing people's websites so that they say different things than what they really said and stuff like that. Um, in this case though, I think even though I, I knew all of this stuff because, you know, because I, of my job, I don't really use it regularly. And this was a chance for me to just explore a lot of different tools. Um, I think some places that you could look for more inspiration are, um, I think Nike has a couple of like p interesting pieces of information about how they prevent people from buying too many pairs of shoes from their website. 
And so you can kind of look at, I, I'd recommend looking at some companies that have um, a lot of botting behavior and like ho talking to them about how they uh, prevent this stuff. That's usually how you find out all the really cool techniques. Thank you. Thank you so much. Arigato gozaimasu. <laughs> Sumon? Is that the word? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>